Good morning. It's um, or, or good evening, wherever you may be. It is a sunny spring morning in New York City. I've got a curtain situation, so I'm uh, looking at you this way. I'm Adam Lupel, IPI Vice President, and it is my pleasure to welcome you all to the launch of our most recent report, Blue on Blue, Investigating Sexual Abuse of Peacekeepers by Phoebe Donnelly, Diane Mazzarana, and Evan Popworth. This research is um, the product of IPI's dedicated program on women, peace, and security. And specifically, it forms part of our Women in Peace Operations Project through our three-year partnership with the Government of Canada's ELSI initiative. Allow me to take the opportunity to thank the Government of Canada and the great ELSI team for their support and their uh, critically important leadership on this issue. One of our... Uh, principal aims across all our work uh, in women, peace, and security is to challenge the gendered assumptions about both women and men, which persists across the theory and practice of peace and security. And this includes perceptions about safety within peacekeeping missions. As I think we're all aware, the safety and well-being of peacekeepers is rightfully a priority of the Secretary General, specifically through the Action for Peacekeeping Initiative, uh, A4P and uh, A4P plus. But while the perceived uh, threat to peacekeeper safety and well-being is often seen as coming from outside of the mission through uh, direct attack or otherwise, this research has found that threats to peacekeepers' safety and well-being are also coming from within the missions themselves. Sexual exploitation and abuse by UN peacekeepers of uh, local communities is well-documented phenomenon, which continues to be a stain on the UN system. But this study is among the first to investigate, document, and analyze the witnessing and experience of sexual abuse against women, men, and gender non-conforming military and police peacekeepers themselves within mission settings. The patterns of abuse documented in this report show that sexual abuse against peacekeepers and the sexual exploitation and abuse of host communities by peacekeepers are actually connected. Many of the same factors of organizational culture can be found at the root of both phenomena, including patriarchal norms, exaggerated but narrow conceptions of masculinity, and practices of domination. This means we do have the tools to respond. In 2005, when he was special advisor to the Secretary General Kofi Annan, IPI's current president, Zaid Rod al Hussein created a comprehensive strategy to eliminate future sexual exploitation and abuse in UN peacekeeping operations, also known uh, as the Zaid Report. Since that report, the UN infrastructure and commitment to addressing sexual exploitation and abuse, specifically of host communities, has grown in, in many positive ways. It is time for this attention and support to expand to addressing sexual abuse of peacekeepers themselves. We hope this report, Blue on Blue, and its recommendations will be a first step in that direction. We have a, a great panel to discuss all of this, and I will turn to the moderator shortly. But first, we will hear further opening remarks from uh, Ambassador Richard Eibeter, Deputy Permanent Representative of Canada to the United Nations. Uh, Ambassador, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, uh, Adam. Bonjour tout le monde. Ça fait plaisir d'être ici avec vous. Thanks, everyone. Um, don't worry, I'm going to speak in English. There's no interpretation uh, available. Um, happy Monday morning. Uh, a big thank you to IPI, um, to the panelists, and to participants. Um, to the panelists, many of whom I uh, I know and have the had the pleasure of learning from you and hearing from you um, on on other issues. Uh, and look, really look forward to this opportunity to to learn from you again. It's Sexual Assault Awareness Month. Um, so really happy that we can time this discussion um, with others that I know are happening both here in New York and, and, and around the world. And they're all premised on trying to do better, <laughs> trying to learn from, from data and try to understand, as, as Adam was saying, what are the tools that are available uh, to us? Um, 
I'm really happy that Ad, uh, Adam spoke about um, the artificiality of this internal versus external divide. <laughs> um, I think that affects uh, everyone and kind of, you know, kind of how our brains are a little bit set up some, sometimes, um, including us here uh, at the Permanent Mission of, of Canada. Um, we have a gender pledge uh, that we sent out to all permanent um, missions here. And um, what was really interesting in our experience is that after a couple of years, um, we undertook a gender audit. Um, to look at whether we've done what we said we were going to do, <laughs> um, whether there were any gaps that kind of came out of it, um, and how we could learn and improve. And one of the gaps that was identified in our gender audit um, was a lack of clarity on uh, how to cope with instances of sexual harassment or allegations of sexual harassment um, and abuse. And the gap that was identified was this internal-external gap. So we were covered kind of on our premises or amongst ourselves, but you know, what do we do on UN premises and other permanent missions with other stakeholders? What are the guidelines there? Who's responsible? What are our obligations as employers and managers? And how do we think through this? Um, and we took that insight um, really seriously uh, and spent a whole bit of time coming up with new guidelines um, and sharing that with staff and undertaking some, some, some training. Uh, this is our first year of our new um, sexual harassment guidelines here at the at the mission, and I don't want to pretend that they're perfect, um, but I do want to uh, express some confidence in our um, sincere and genuine desire to break down this internal external barrier <laughs> and, and to really understand um, not only our obligations as, as managers, but our workplace as an ecosystem. Um, where uh, some of the issues that uh, I know the, the, the researchers identified per, are pervasive, whether they're inside your workplace, outside, amongst colleagues, among, amongst um, stakeholders. Uh, and really, that's all I have to say by, by way of introduction is, again, a big thank you um, to the researchers for making it practical, making it real, making it concrete, um, and showing us, uh, I think, through their research, through the paper, and through the discussion today, how we can up our game um, on this. So, un grand merci à tout le monde. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Really, really appreciate that, uh, those comments. Um, I'm not going to turn over to our panel and to our uh, moderator, IPI Research Fellow Gretchen Baldwin. I also just want to take the opportunity to, to express my sincere gratitude to Gretchen for all her work on Women, Peace and Security, uh, keeping uh, this work really fundamentally alive at IPI over the last uh, several years. She is actually moving on to be a researcher in peace operations and conflict management um, at CIPRI. And I know we're going to still be working uh, together uh, on these topics as, uh, as the months and years progress, but I just wanted to say uh, thank you, uh, Gretchen, really. It's been, uh, it's been really a pleasure uh, um, to work with you in, in recent years. Gretchen, please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Adam. Um, it's very bittersweet to be moderating my last IPI event, at least as an IPI staff member. Please do call me back sometime. Uh, so thank you so much, Adam, for your remarks, and Ambassador Arbeiter for being here. To everyone who's joined us via social media, LinkedIn, the IPI website, um, we really appreciate having you here to launch just an incredibly important policy report. Um, I feel really lucky to have seen this project in its earliest stages all the way through to its launch into the world. Um, and it, I just am so impressed with the way that this report builds really beautifully on earlier work that on gender and peacekeeping that both IPI and a lot of our partner organizations have been doing over the last few years. So I'd really just encourage anybody who's on the webinar right now um, who's watching this, if you have not yet read the report, please do. Um, it's absolutely phenomenal. It's got some really great data visualizations, one of my personal favorite things. Um, so yeah, I really just would encourage everyone to read it. And I also just very quickly want to say my own thank you to Canada and to the LC team. Um, it really has been an honor to work on such important research and convenings over the last, I guess for me, two and a half years. Um, we've just really, I'm, I'm genuinely so proud of the work that we've done at IPI on this. Um, and I'm just really, really grateful to the LC initiative for supporting that work. Um, a quick note for the audience, if you're in our webinar, um, please do be submitting questions to the Q&A section um, as panelists are speaking, just as things come to you, feel free to, um, you know, drop questions in, in that Q&A section, and we'll ideally have around 40 minutes um, for you to have some interaction with um, the panelists. So that's quite enough for me. Um, we'll now kick things off with um, one of the report authors. We have 
Um, all three of our report authors here today. Dr. Phoebe Donnelly is a senior fellow here at the International Peace Institute and head of our WPS program. Phoebe will be presenting the report findings um, to start us off. And Dr. Diane Mazarana is a research professor at the Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy and at the Fletcher School at Tufts University. She's also a research director at the Feinstein International Center and a fellow at the World Peace Foundation. And Diane will be fielding your questions on the report. And I do just also wanna say, we have our third report author, Evan Pepworth here today. Um, Evan is a former research intern with us here at IPI. So we're very happy to have kept her in our orbit by uh, maybe tricking her into <laughs> to continuing to work with us. But, Evan, Phoebe, Diane, congratulations um, on a really incredible report. And without further ado, Phoebe, the floor is yours. Thank you, Gretchen. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Canada, and to the whole LC team. It's my pleasure to be here presenting this report. In a survey completed by 457 peacekeepers, nearly one in 10 peacekeepers had personally experienced sexual abuse while on mission. Of the women peacekeepers surveyed, nearly 30% experienced sexual abuse while on mission. These patterns are disturbing, but they're not unique to this study. In a decaf study, sexual and gender-based harassment was found to be the second most common barrier to women's participation in peacekeeping operations. Sexism, racism, and sexual harassment and assault were found as one of the biggest challenges for women military peacekeepers, as found in a study by Dr. Lotte Vermeer for IPI. Given these findings, as well as widespread evidence of sexual abuse within national militaries and police forces, the goal of this study was to document and understand specific patterns of sexual abuse against peacekeepers. In addition to understanding patterns of abuse, we also wanted to understand the enabling factors for this abuse and the existing tools for reporting abuse and supporting victims who are peacekeepers. This project is part of IPI and the ELSI Initiative's broader work to improve the meaningful participation of women in peace operations. To understand women's experiences in peacekeeping, we also need to understand men's gendered experiences and how and if they differ from women's. Throughout this project, we sought to disaggregate the data by gender, and you'll see that throughout the report, especially in the visuals that Gretchen mentioned. Finally, men and women peacekeepers are not a monolithic group, so further research should explore how sexual abuse interacts with other identity factors like age, nationality, race, ethnicity, and sexuality. So I'm gonna start by providing an overview of what we researched and really getting us on the same page of what we're talking about today. That internal external overview was really helpful. I wanna talk about how we did the research, the patterns we discovered, and then briefly discuss a key enabling factor of sexual abuse, organizational culture. And then I'll move to briefly give an overview of our existing, of the existing policies for addressing this abuse and our recommendations. For terminology, we use the term sexual abuse to encompass three different types of abuse, sexual discrimination, sexual harassment, and sexual assault. We wanted to show the spectrum of abuse peacekeepers experience, and we also wanted to avoid adding another acronym. So since these are all forms of abuse, we will refer to sexual abuse throughout the presentation, and we do so in the report. In addition to experiencing sexual abuse, we also wanted to document witnessing sexual abuse. This also has negative repercussions on women peacekeepers and contributes to an unwelcoming and harmful organizational culture. Many of you are familiar with the terminology sexual exploitation and abuse, or SEA, but this is primarily used within the UN system to refer to sexual abuse against host communities. So the most basic distinction between what we studied today and SEA is the identity of the victims. Today, we'll be talking about sexual abuse when peacekeepers are the victims. And as already been discussed, Despite normative frameworks that try to separate these patterns of abuse, we think they're interlinked and the infrastructure to combat SEA can be helpful for combating sexual abuse of peacekeepers. So to understand this topic, we started research with the workshop with uniformed men and women, member state representatives and UN officials. 
We then moved to interviews. But after workshop discussions, we realized the challenge in getting people to discuss this topic, which is somewhat a finding on its own. Researching sexual abuse is often challenging, but speaking about sexual abuse in hierarchical organizations like militaries can be particularly taboo. This led us to develop an online anonymous survey that was distributed through our networks and completed by 457 peacekeepers. I previewed some of our findings from that survey, but I wanna go through a few of them in a bit more detail. From the survey participants, nearly one in 10 said they personally experienced sexual abuse. Of the women peacekeepers surveyed, 28% said they experienced sexual abuse while on mission and nearly 26% witnessed it. Of the men peacekeepers surveyed, 2% reported experienced sexual abuse and 4% reported witnessing it. We know, however, that there's widespread underreporting of male victims in military organizations. So these percentages are likely higher, military organizations and more broadly, but we know there are patterns of sexual abuse against men within militarized organizations. So again, another area to flag for future research. The witnessing piece here is also important because men who don't experience or witness abuse may overlook or misunderstand the abuse being perpetrated against their colleagues. The most common forms of abuse experienced from the survey data was harassment, then discrimination, and there were eight reported incidents of sexual assault disclosed just from our survey population. So the impact of this abuse, women peacekeepers who were victims of sexual abuse in our survey reported a range of negative impacts, including on their mental health, career progression, and family. At least one survey participant noticed she left her peacekeeping career as a result of this abuse. While we don't have detailed data on the negative impacts for peacekeepers, we know that, for example, within the U.S. military, female veterans who experience military sexual trauma are at a heightened risk for suicide. In terms of what we could learn about perpetrators, for more than 25% of women who experience sexual abuse, they experience multiple abuses from the same perpetrator. So this led us to conclude there are serial perpetrators committing this abuse. For, for participants who identified the gender of the perpetrator, 94% were men and 6% were women. A really key point I wanna flag about perpetrators is that in discussions of safety of peacekeepers within the UN, the, in, the idea is usually that the perpetrator is a local conflict actor, but this was not what we found in our discussions or survey data. Only 4% of sexual abuse was perpetrated by a local civilian actor and only 1% by a local conflict actor, according to survey participants. In 55% of the cases in the survey where the perpetrator was identified, they were of a higher rank than of the victim. So this is taking us to this idea about power inequalities and the organizational culture. Taken together, together, the data demonstrated an organizational culture of impunity for perpetrators. Interview participants spoke about senior members of peacekeeping missions feeling they could get away with sexual abuse. And one interview participant described that perpetrators are quote unquote, hiding in plain sight within the missions. Interview and workshop participants said that peacekeeping missions are viewed as a zone of exception where behavior that might not be acceptable outside of the mission context is tolerated. This is amplified by the use of alcohol. As summarized by one interview participant, the culture of the peacekeeping mission is key to understanding the problem of sexual abuse and addressing it. As they noted, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Within, we also learned from the survey and interview participants what they would do if they experienced sexual abuse, what mechanisms are there to support them. And we know that reporting mechanisms and training on SEA of host communities are robust and they've come a long way. There's widespread knowledge about these mechanisms among peacekeepers. However, even though SEA and sexual abuse of peacekeepers are likely fueled by similar behaviors like institutional cultures and inequalities, there's less policy overlap in responding to these patterns of abuse and a lack of standardized response mechanisms for sexual abuse when the peacekeepers are victims. There was general confusion in interviews and survey data about the process for reporting and responding to abuse. 
This could stem from the fact that the UN gives autonomy to troop and police contributing countries over how much or how little they address sexual abuse by peacekeepers in their ranks perpetrated against other peacekeepers in their ranks. And to link back to the theme I started with relating to the meaningful participation of women, because of inadequate response mechanisms, women peacekeepers talked about addressing this issue themselves. In particular, senior women felt the need to look out for more junior women. And all of this adds an extra burden to women peacekeepers. So to conclude, we grouped our recommendations in four key areas. I'm going to give the headline of those areas, but we're happy to go into more detail about them in our Q&A, and there's a lot more detail in the report. The first is to transform the organizational culture that enables sexual abuse of peacekeepers. We speak about a focus on leadership and creating a receptive environment. The second is to mandate robust training to prevent sexual abuse of peacekeepers. I wanna flag that training's not the solution to every problem as it sometimes is referred, but in this case, training and discussion done by experts would be a useful part of a larger response. This training must include a shared understanding of sexual har harassment, discrimination, and abuse, and it's linked to SEA. Third, we need to require TCCs and PCCs to address sexual abuse of peacekeepers within their contingents. Fourth, and really essential, is to create a robust, confidential, and victim-centric reporting and inf investigation infrastructure. A reporting structure must be anonymous and outside of the chain of command. Also, there's the opportunity to expand and utilize existing mechanisms being used for SEA response, specifically flagging the Office of Victim Rights Advocate, as we'll hear more about from our next speaker. Thank you very much, and I look forward to the questions and comments. Thank you so much, Phoebe, um, for that overview of the report. We will now hear from each of our distinguished panelists. Panelists, um, I will introduce you one at a time just before your individual remarks. So our first panelist is Jane Connors. Ms. Connors is the United Nations Victims Rights Advocate on Sexual Exploitation and Abuse. Previously, she served as the Director of International Advocacy for Amnesty International. From 1996 to 2015, she held various positions at the United Nations, including at the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. Before joining the UN, she held academic posts in the United Kingdom and Australia, including 14 years at the School of Oriental and African Studies, so as in London. Ms. Connors has published widely on UN human rights mechanisms, the human rights of women and children, and in particular, gender-based violence. So Ms. Connors, our question to you to sort of kick off your remarks is, what lessons learned from your work with victims of sexual exploitation and abuse in host communities could be applied to supporting peacekeepers who are victims of sexual abuse? And in what ways are these two patterns of abuse connected? Ms. Connors, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. And please call me Jane. That Ms. Connors really, uh, well, you know how old I am. You could have counted it up. Um, mm -hmm. um, thank you um, to the International, P uh, International Peace Institute for inviting me to speak. And congratulations to the authors. Um, it's a very interesting report, and I'm sure it'll generate much discussion. Um, I'll just tell uh, everybody a little bit about my role in case they don't know about it and then and I will immediately go to your questions thereafter. So um, in 2017 our Secretary General introduced uh, a new strategy to uh, confront sexual exploitation and abuse by United Nations personnel and its centerpiece is to place the rights and dignity of victims at the forefront of prevention and response. And that cuts across the strategies, other elements, addressing impunity, building a multi-stakeholder approach, and reorienting communications for transparency. Um, it seems strange, but this emphasis on victims' rights is a shift from the organization's earlier approaches, which focused on the conduct and discipline of, of offenders and its reputation. Now our priority, and uh, it's a tough one to pull off, but our priority is the complex and lasting impact of sexual exploitation and abuse on individual victims, their families, communities, and trust in our organizations. Now, to bring about this shift, 
uh, the Secretary General created my post, the Victims' Rights Advocate post. He also requested the designation of field victims' rights advocates in four countries, the Central African Republic, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Haiti, and South Sudan. And he asked that those, um, those uh, posts uh, be dedicated um, eventually. And he also advocated uh, the nomination of other uh, advocates in other settings making it clear that sexual exploitation and abuse are system-wide concerns. So that means our roles are about victims of all our personnel, uniformed, civilian, international, national, in peace, humanitarian or development contexts. Um, as of 2021, we have these four dedicated offices in those countries. We started work, um, the former ones and I started work in September 2017. My work is generally advocacy, and in that work, I seek to give visibility to victims and make it clear that at the core of these wrongs is not our reputation, but a woman, girl, man or boy who is hurt, fearful, often subject to reprisals, intersectional discrimination, stigma, and frequently left with a child. I visit countries uh, to meet victims and hear their concerns. And this probably goes to your second question. During my visits, I'm struck by the fact that many interlocutors, including peacekeeping personnel, raise sexual harassment and domestic violence with me. Um, they don't speak about necessarily sexual exploitation and abuse. The drivers of these sets of conduct are similar, if not the same, as those of sexual exploitation and abuse. And they also, I believe, underpin sexual abuse of peacekeeping personnel. So we're looking at power imbalance, situations of vulnerability, lack of respect, and stereotypes related to gender roles, opportunity, and a sense of impunity. Despite our zero tolerance policy, sexual exploitation, sexual abuse, and sexual harassment are, I'm afraid, tolerated and their seriousness and impact are not understood. Um, many of the countries where these misconducts occur also, and the countries from which perpetrators are drawn, have weak legal and policy frameworks to prevent and address these wrongs and tolerate harmful practices, especially early marriage, which enable them. Now the field, I'm getting to, your, that's your second question more or less, what are the drivers? And I think they are the drivers. I'll just get to the what I think I've learned with um, regard to um, with regard to what has done well. The field victims rights advocates are the first point of call for victims. They are there to speak and listen to them, coordinate support and assistance, encourage them to report and be involved in accountability processes such as United Nations administrative and di uh, disciplinary procedures and national criminal and civil cases. Most importantly, and this is a complaint I get from many victims, they keep them updated on what is happening. And the most important insight I've gained through working with victims, uh, which could be applied to supporting peacekeepers, and I've seen your recommendation, um, is um, who are victims of sexual abuse, is drawn from these advocates. This work has shown that the presence of a qualified person on the ground dedicated to prioritizing victims' rights, someone they trust to believe them and understand their experience and trauma and to whom they can turn for assistance, confident they will advocate on their behalf, makes a real difference. And I've seen that the advocates have encouraged victims to come forward and often they do many years after the event through outreach and communications activities. We have complaint mechanisms of various sorts but the advocates stand ready to interact personally with victims and we find that they find that preferable. They want to speak to a real person. They're not that fascinated by um, online or whatever complaint boxes generally get job applications. Online things are not used because online isn't necessarily very uh, available. They're also uh, central to the development and delivery of livelihood support projects resourced through a small trust fund in support of victims of sexual exploitation and abuse. I could go into their actions, but I see I'm, we're, we're pressed for time and some of them could, could be raised in Q&A. But the actions that they put in by, by championing the victims go some way to restoring their dignity, 
holds us to account also some way and rebuilds trust in our organizations. And I would suggest, uh, and I suggest this in many contexts, most recently to FIFA, um, which uh, produced a very interesting report last year, as you will have seen on uh, sexual exploitation and abuse and harassment in sport. I think it would be very helpful to explore how a person to carry out this role in the context, the context we're discussing could, uh, today could be uh, designated. Some UN entities, and this is something to think about as well, such as UNHCR and the World Bank, have designated qualified individuals in their headquarters to guide victim survivors of sexual harassment through informal and formal processes. So I think um, I've answered your, uh, your questions just to reiterate on the drivers of sexual exploitation and abuse, sexual harassment, and what we're talking about here. Um, I, I spoke of those, but I, I think the hierarchical and patriarchal, um, patriarchal nature of the military and its attitude, uh, attitudes which lead to silence surrounding these wrongs, they're really, um, they've been revealed through your report, various inquiries, such as the Australian Sex Discrimination Commissioners. And I was just recently participating in a, a workshop for senior military. And um, those attitudes are expressed. I mean, they, they try not to express them in front of me, but they do come out. Um, so I will conclude at that point. I uh, hope I've answered the questions and also given you some idea of my work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jane. That was absolutely fascinating and somehow also a bit encouraging and in the midst of a very dark topic. So thank you so, so much. Um, our next panelist is Dr. Purna Sen. Dr. Sen joined the Child and Woman Abuse Studies Unit at London Metropolitan University in November of 2020 as a visiting professor where her work focuses on internationalizing and facilitating joined up learning on work to end violence against women. She has worked extensively in the UK and beyond on inequalities and the pursuit of human rights, including as deputy director of the Institute of Public Affairs at the London School of Economics and Political Science, LSE, where she also taught gender and development as head of human rights for the Commonwealth Secretariat and as director for the Asia Pacific program at Amnesty International. Perna most recently worked at UN Women, initially as director of the policy division and later as the executive coordinator and spokesperson on addressing sexual harassment and other forms of discrimination. And Perna, thank you so much for being here with us. Um, and the question that I would love to hear your thoughts and have your reflections on um, is how can the UN system better address sexual abuse across all of its components? And what institution, none of these are one question. I keep saying we have one question, but there are multiple questions for you. The second part of that question is what institutional changes and commitments can be made that would help prevent and address sexual abuse of peacekeepers? Perna, thank you for being with us and you have the floor. Pleasure, thank you Gretchen for that uh, array of questions. Um, <clears throat> let's see how far we can get. I will apologize in advance. I have got terrible cough, so if I suddenly mute myself, it's so you to spare you from hearing me coughing, but I am here and I will return. Um, first of all, uh, I welcome this report. I welcome the light being shone uh, increasingly as part of our global efforts to uncover um, and to unmask the forms of sexual abuse that go on. I see this as one of those steps towards that bigger global narrative. Uh, it's never early when a new light shines on a new place. Um, but I do think over the last few decades and especially over the last five, six, seven years, there's been a, 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 an incredible increase and in a really important um, scaling up of that process of uncovering, of naming what needs to be done and of holding people accountable. Now, um, I particularly want to think about the victim survivor focused approaches. And I want to think about what accountability would look, well, not look, what it would look like, but how do we get there? Because we're very clear that it's missing. So I welcome the report and thank you for having me here to talk about. Before I address your couple of questions, I'd just like to make a couple of framing remarks, if I may. Um, so first of all, talking about sexual abuse of peacekeepers is of course talking about sexual harassment. They are at their workplace. Um, this is about receiving and being on the end of um, unwanted sexual uh, behavior and conduct. Um, and I very much welcome the shift we've seen over the last few years to recognizing the connections between different forms of sexual abuse in different contexts by different people as part of what we've always called in this work, and I've been doing this for 30 years and race equality work for 10 years before that, what we've always called the continuum of violence. 
uh, that exists all around us, wherever we are. Um, so that, that new terminology that's been used over the last couple of years, sexual exploitation, abuse and harassment, uh, is very welcome. And I see this uh, particular piece of work as sitting on that, um, that, that, that conjuncture between what happens in the workplace, what happens in the world at large and in, in the IPI's interest, uh, sexual exploitation, abuse of, of, of host communities. Um, and this sort of sits in that area where, uh, where I think one of the problematics that really, really, really troubles me is this assumption that those doing good work, in inverted commas, are good people. And that for me serves as a mask, a cloak that denies um, examination and therefore the resulting uh, accountability that ought to be present in all places where people work, uh, have leisure, have recreation, uh, and ought to be free of this sort of abuse. Um, uh, secondly, um, I think it's important, and this, this refers a little bit to your recommendations, it's important that the UN does tidy up and continue to improve its processes for taking reports and for investigating them. Um, and uh, actually Jane's better place than me to say how, the, how far the OIOS, who you talk about in the report, the Office of Internal Investigations um, and Oversight Services, how far their efforts to develop survivor focused investigation systems, how far they've got. So for me, in the absence of that information, uh, a recommendation to give more work through them is problematic. It needs that context to, to make it a rightful recommendation. So uh, let me, before um, time runs out, let me just then turn to your questions about what the UN can do. Um, so some people will say, unfortunately, I actually think it's helpful that over the last few years, Me Too, the work on sexual harassment, the work on sexual exploitation has shone a critical light on what's happening at the UN and its shortcomings. It's only that sort of uh, inspection, that sort of exposure uh, and examination that tends to prompt organizations and institutions towards meaningful change. Um, unfortunately, it's not always meaningful. It can be rhetorical and we can come back to that in a moment. But those sorts of crises and traumas are what tend to kickstart change in organization. So it has been as a result of that, that the UN has really stepped up. Initially, the work on sexual exploitation and abuse over the last couple of decades, but more recently on sexual harassment. And so for me, the first step the UN has to do is to clean up its own house. And before you get to the quite demanding and quite harsh uh, measures that you've suggested, with which I agree, that sort of criticism, like withholding payment for um, troop and police contributing countries if they don't investigate allegations of sexual abuse, um, those sorts of standards need to be applied in-house. And until staff, interns, JPOs have confidence that their own systems listen to them um, and can deal with their uh, experiences, then I think it's problematic for the UN to be ex uh, demanding exacting standards of others. So clean your own house up. Um, secondly, I do agree with you that the UN needs to be robust in its dealings with uh, police and troop contributing countries uh, and I mentioned the recommendation that you've made in the report about withholding payment. I think that'd be very, very interesting. I don't know that the SG would be up for that so I think there's a discussion to be had and it'd be very interesting for the diplomatic community to be having that conversation I think with the SG to see how far that might fly. Um, I think there's a huge gap in terms of giving substance to the voices, the experiences, the knowledge, the wisdom and the expertise of victim survivors. I think we are caught, you know, you talk about power and inequality and hierarchy in the military, but they operate really strongly within the UN as well. You know, um, status matters, hierarchy matters, how we are addressed matters, who speaks first in a meeting is determined by their status, isn't it? You know, we've been there, we know this. Um, and so those structures of inequality, those hierarchical rigidities operate within the UN as well as in the military. So I think it's a real challenge for the UN, for the experts, for some of us in academia, for some of us in other policy and lawmaking context to accept and to understand that those who've been on the receiving end of abuse actually have something meaningful to contribute to the work we do in shaping it. And sometimes we have to defer. And I always say that the task is to ask questions, to listen, and the third bit is really important, stop talking. 
listen. So for me, what the UN could do <clears throat> is to place more center stage, victim survivors who wish to speak and input to what they're doing, and many don't want to, why would they? Or their advocates as second, uh, a second tier of uh, expertise. So for example, if OIOS is developing or has developed its body of victim focused um, investigative procedures, have they been given to, shared with, approved by, evaluated by victim survivors who have either sought to report or who have not reported because they find the processes opaque or slow or unsupportive. So I would actually recommend setting up, the SG would set up, I would love it if the SG would set up an advisory group, and I would love it the diplomats to support this or to pursue or to you know, promote it, um, uh, an advisory group uh, predominated by victim survivors and their advocates around changes uh, to ensure that they have meaning and substance that's relevant to victim survivors. You talk in the report about um, people not wanting to report, uh, for very good reason. I've talked in a publication about the irrationality of reporting. Currently for me, listening to victim survivors is it's not a sensible thing to do. You don't know what's gonna happen. You don't know how long it's gonna take. You don't know whether there'll be any outcome. Why would you put yourself through that on top of the trauma of being abused? And in addition to any stigma that attaches still to victim survivors of sexual abuse, because it does stick. It sticks to you rather than the perpetrator of the abuse. So those sorts of things need to be you know, undone. Next, go beyond rhetoric. The UN needs to go beyond rhetoric. And the UN and all organizations reach very quickly for terms that they know will capture uh, attention and garner some sympathy. So for me, the two most popular terms that are so easily used are zero tolerance and victims focused approaches. Well, zero tolerance is a really, really important expression, but what does it mean in practice? And if you ask any of the organizations that use these, often they don't give you the substance. They don't, they don't have content beyond the language. So I would like to see more work done around that. I mean, I have done my own work on um, what that means and what that looks like and I've published it. Um, and the other one is victim-centered approaches and any changes, any changes, whether it's policy, whether it's investigation um, and so on, need to be, in my view, grounded in meaningful relevance to victims and survivors. Be transparent, tell us what's happened, record what's happened. I'm not interested in excuses that say, we can't tell you because of confidentiality, not good enough. If you want trust, and if you want people to uh, go through the systems you set up, then you have to share what happens. If you don't have that organizational transparency, you can't just say, trust me, and suddenly it'll happen. Um, you talked about training earlier, Phoebe, and we, we discussed this at an earlier point. But if you look at the work around training on sexual harassment, and I think sexual exploitation abuse also over the last 30 years, um, organizations quickly jump to saying we do training, but the content of that training and the effectiveness of that training is, is as significant as developing it in the first place. In fact, I would say more significant. There's no point doing training if it doesn't have any impact. So look at the content of that training, the impact of that training, the behavioral change of that training. Um, and, and again, think about how that would, um, that could be incorporated into everyday work. You know, if you look at, uh, if you look at 30 years of evaluation of sexual harassment training, the majority of the evaluation says it's not, it's not useful. It hasn't had an impact, it's ineffective. Now we did an analysis of why, we recommended a change model of training uh, around these issues. And I have personally delivered uh, that new model in a couple of places. I think it needs some tweaking, but I think it has a substance of a better approach. Um, uh, on a very specific measure, uh, I believe the coordinator on the sexual exploitation abuse, Jen Holt, is leaving soon. Now, I don't want to say anything personal. I do want to say that there has been some issues around doing two roles um, and the effectiveness and the reach and the accessibility of the UN structures. And I think the UN needs to think about who it appoints to that role, that it has the confidence of civil society, uh, activists and representatives of victim survivors, uh, including within these sorts of settings that your report addresses. And I would urge that whoever comes into these roles, not only understands organizational and institutional dynamics, but actually has the confidence of civil society uh, in that role. Otherwise they won't be meaningful to those who are abused. Um, and overall, I think that, that, that those sorts of initiatives, um, firstly, I've summarized them in a, in, a, in a little publication around organizational cultural change, which I think is absolutely crucial. And 
happy to share that link if it's helpful. But I think the big picture is to move from what victims and survivors see within their militaries, within the police, within the UN as institutional betrayal and move to a place where there is institutional courage to face the difficulties, not to hide behind doing good humanitarian or peacekeeping work, but to say, we haven't got it right. We need your help to get it right. And we will learn. Um, and we will learn from you, even if you're not one of our senior people, and we will listen to you, uh, and we have a way to go. Much more to say, but I'll stop because of timing issues, and maybe we can come back in the Q&A. Thanks, Gretchen. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Parna. No, that was really, I know there's, there's so much to explore on this topic, and I was furiously taking notes as you were speaking, um, so I do hope we get to come back to some of these themes during the Q&A. Um, which another reminder just for our audience in case you tuned in late, please do be submitting questions in the Q&A function um, in the webinar and we'll be happy to get to those once our uh, panelists finish speaking. Our next panelist is Philippa Adams. Philippa is Australia's police advisor to the United Nations and chair of the Strategic Police Advisory Group. She has been leading Australia's engagement at the UN on policing matters for over 13 years. Philippa also successfully negotiated the first inclusion of sexual harassment language in the UN Special Committee of Peacekeeping Operations Report, which is very impressive. Um, so Philippa, our question to you, which is actually one question that we managed to <laughs> summarize. Um, our question to you is, what are the gaps in member states' understanding of the issue of sexual abuse of peacekeepers? It is kind of a two-parter. And what is needed <laughs> to get member states to address this issue? Philippa, you have the floor. Thanks, Gretchen. And I would be disappointed if I just got a simple one part question. And uh, so unfair to have to follow Perna and Jane too, because they've made so many incredible points. But interestingly, I think my answer is actually hopefully going to address a lot of what Perna just said. Um, so to the first part of your question, I think a key component, one of the major drivers of the gaps in member states' understandings of the issue is most likely a reflection of the gaps in society in our respective organizations as to the prevalence of sexual harassment and abuse in security forces. I'll use my own organization, the Australian Federal Police, as an example. In 2015, the Australian Federal Police began a program of work to improve the diversity of our workplace, particularly in relation to gender, and look to identify and remove possible barriers to achieving that diversity. An external party was appointed to conduct a review of the AFP and the frameworks we had in place and the resulting report was shocking and disappointing. 46% of women and 20% of men surveyed by the review team had been subjected to sexual harassment. An even more troubling finding were pockets of behavior that were described by our then commissioner as criminal. 2% of the surveyed staff had been subjected to actual or attempted sexual assault. The report found that while the frameworks, or well, the mechanisms to deal with sexual harassment and abuse existed, our internal culture, our internal practices were holding us back. The report exposed a culture that allowed these behaviours. The AFP undertook to immediately implement all of the recommendations of the report. They were challenging and they were uncomfortable. But it was acknowledged that for real change, for sustainable change, for change that was meaningful, we needed to be made uncomfortable. And some of you may be made to feel uncomfortable by the findings in the IPI report, and that's okay. As the IPI report recommends, without the transformation of the organizational cultures that enable sexual abuse of peacekeepers, we will not see real change. And that cultural change needs to be addressed at the troop and police contributing country level, as well as in the mission environment. An immediate change the AFP made after the release of the report was the introduction of the safe place concept. Now, we weren't unique. In this, we'd modeled what we were doing on successful concepts we had seen elsewhere. The safe place is just that, it's a safe place. It's victim focused and it provides holistic support and advice to members who are experiencing, have experienced, or even if they're aware of sexual harassment, sexual assault, serious harassment within the AFP. The Safe Place provides an opportunity for members to be heard, to be provided with various options, to be given a voice and to be listened to. It gives them a way forward. The irony to me of the Safe Place concept is that it actually mirrors so much of how modern policing treats victims outside of the AFP or outside of our organisations. 
we hadn't developed our own internal practices to match what we had been doing for many, many years for victims outside of the organisation. The report told us that the lived experience for too many of our members was that they were victimised time and time again by the processes we were asking them to step through in order to have their cases heard. This echoes another of the key recommendations of the IPI report, to cre create a robust confidentiality and victim-centric reporting and investigation infrastructure. This is why I'm delighted to be able to be here today and support the launch of the report, as I believe it goes a long way to addressing the second part of your question, what is needed to get member states to address this issue? I think we'd agree there needs to be a global cultural shift to address the prevalence of sexual harassment and abuse in the workplace, but on a more pragmatic level, what can we do at the UN level with our fellow member states? The most significant pushback I have received from member state colleagues when we begin to talk about sexual harassment and abuse in peacekeeping is the lack of data. The anecdotes alone are not enough to convince them that this is a problem that needs addressing. But if we see this issue in our home countries, in our organisations, how could we believe that this behaviour is not deployed into a peacekeeping environment with all of the added pressure and isolation that goes along with the mission environment? As the report clearly shows us, the mission environment is not immune to sexual harassment and abuse. Our disinclination to have these difficult and somewhat uncomfortable conversations about the frequency of sexual harassment and abuse in a command and control environment does not reflect reality and only does us harm. These behaviours not only have a devastating impact on individuals, they divide teams and ultimately they will undermine operational effectiveness. Swift action is required to hold perpetrators to account. Equally, a robust system that provides support for victims and which responds sensitively and expeditiously is needed. I am hopeful that forums like this will create the opportunity for a more open discourse without the inherent defensiveness that so often comes along when we begin to discuss reforms such as the one suggested by IPI. Real change, genuine change is not easy. The hardest part about these possible reforms and about accepting our own limitations and acknowledging where our culture is letting us down is implicit acknowledgement that we've all been part of it in some way. I would encourage colleagues to read and reflect on the report as come confronting as some of them may feel to you. Reflect on the part you have played in creating what is there today, good and bad. Reflect on the causes that have prevented the organization from being fully inclusive. Examine some of the structures, processes and systems that may have inadvertently or otherwise allowed for the unequal treatment of women, including the behaviors identified in this report. By listening and reflecting, I am hopeful member states will gain a deeper understanding of what needs to change and what our part will be in creating that change. Thank you. Thank you so much, Philippa. And I, I really, I especially appreciate you highlighting that need. I mean, I think it ties just so well, <laughs> so perfectly back into this discussion of power structures and the, the power dynamics that are at play here, right? That, any of us who are members of institutions within which this is happening have a role to play because of power, right? Even if you yourself are not the harasser, you are not exempt from, from the overall organizational culture. Thank you so much. I do very quickly want to flag for our panelists. Um, a, a number of you have mentioned resources, um, whether it's things that you have published or, or resources that just are relevant to this topic. And we have a few audience members who've asked for those resources. So I'm wondering if, sorry to ask you to multitask, um, but if you, if our panelists have mentioned a resource, if you could maybe put it in our webinar chat and then can I ask the events team to just share those links? Um, I know a lot of people are watching on LinkedIn and maybe we can get those out um, publicly just as the webinar goes on. Um, thank you so much. Okay, without further ado, I'd like to turn to our final panelists for remarks. John Christian Muller is an assistant chief of police with over 20 years of military police and diplomatic experience in Norway and abroad. He, is, he has served in multiple United Nations peacekeeping operations and is currently serving as police and justice counselor at the permanent mission of Norway to the United Nations. 
So John, our question for you today is how can allies and whistleblowers be a key part of reforming problematic organizational cultures that enable the sexual abuse of peacekeepers? And I'm just so pleased that this is such a perfect follow on, I think, to Philippa's comments. Um, so really looking forward to hearing from you, John, and you have the floor. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for the question and uh, being here today. Uh, I'm very grateful for uh, for the topic of today's meeting, and uh, of course to study blue on blue. Uh, I think this really feels a knowledge and uh, attention gap in uh, let's say the, the UN world. Uh, it's a complex question you're raising, but uh, I might be able to identify some key factors, and I will also try to spice it up uh, with a field perspective. Let me start by looking a few years back in time. I mean, how many of you remember the advent of the global Me Too movement? Uh, all of you, I would assume. Uh, then I'd like to ask a more rhetorical question. What did the UN do in response to the movement? Uh, unfortunately, uh, not very much, except maybe printing some extra posters and, uh, and stickers. Uh, and by now, I really must emphasize that I love what I call my organization, the United Nations. Uh, and this is not meant as any shaming of the UN. All big entities face challenges. Nevertheless, my own experience were with the UN. So that's the organization I uh, can uh, speak about. I have spent three years in the field with UN peacekeeping, both as a military and as a police officer in addition to a, a huge number of uh, field visits uh, the last years. So my story today is an anecdote. Maybe it was a one-time occurrence, not uh, a systemic failure, but uh, I doubt that. Through the years, I have spoken with people who have made me believe that my story is not unique. And similar stories have been written about in the news. For instance, the recent uh, WHO scandal last year. Uh, back to me. I was deployed in a UN peace operation as a Norwegian contingent commander. One day, one of my team members, a young female police officer, came to me and told me that uh, the acting chief of section had touched her inappropriately under the table during a meeting where they sat next to each other. At first, I really couldn't believe my own ears. She told me that this has happened not only once, but several times and that he generally had a very sexual attitude against her and other females. Long story short, after listening to her, I found out through my own, let's call it, internal investigation, that this individual had behaved in similar ways toward other young female officers. Due to his rank, none of them wanted to say anything. Everyone wants to get their contract extended. It didn't help that the section chief and also his uh, supervisor at that time had the same nationality. I further learned that uh, several complaints had also been filed against him for uh, racist behavior and other sexual obscene acts. So I decided to tell my story to the section chief when he was back for leave. Nothing happened. Absolutely no action was taken against the individual. He later returned home with a clean record. But something happened against me. Uh, I got in serious trouble a bit later after uh, entirely outlandish allegations were made against me and I almost got repatriated. Uh, with more than 25 years as a civil servant in the military, in the police and in our foreign ministry, I never believed that a system could be so rotten as I experienced in this situation. You all remember the whistleblower story from the UN mission in former Yugoslavia in the 90s. It came to my mind and I realized that unfortunately some things hadn't really changed. I never doubted to tell my story, even though you never know the consequences. Nevertheless, I feel supported by the UN Secretary General through his SEA agenda. I also acknowledge that every organization needs to be aware of its failures in order to improve and set better standards but I'm still not comfortable with how whistleblowers might be treated. That is why Norway, supported by Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, under this year's negotiations in the Special Committee for Peace Operations, proposed the establishment of an independent reporting mechanism that can be used when personnel are not confident they will be protected reporting through their own chain of command, 
or even the established UN mechanisms in the field. If we want to achieve meaningful reform, we need to encourage whistleblowers to tell the stories. Everyone has heard about boomerang cases as mine, going back to hurt the whistleblower. We therefore need to advocate together to collectively put pressure on member states and the UN to establish safe, secure channels for both victims and whistleblowers. These mechanisms must be independent, outside the chain of command, maybe inspired by the ombudsperson mechanism. That's the only way, in my opinion, we can fully address this problem. To conclude, I do not believe experience such as mine are very common, but we all know that one story is one to many. Without a truly zero tolerance work environment, the reputation of the United Nations will suffer. Just one case can destroy everything we have heard in credibility. I want this to change. I know all of you want to. I want a safe and trustworthy work environment in UN operations where I can send my sons and my daughter without worrying about internal harassment, abuse, or even boomerangs. We ask peacekeepers to serve on behalf of the international community in extreme high risk environments to uphold peace and security. And the least we can do is to ensure that our own colleagues do not pose yet another threat. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, John. Thank you especially. Oh, sorry, we have a little feedback. Uh, thanks. Um, thank you so much for, particularly for sharing your story, um, which is distressing. Um, but but so I, there's just so much to be learned from your experience. Um, so thank you to all of our panelists for taking the time to, to be with us today. We have about 30 minutes for questions. Um, so audience members, again, please do feel free to share. Um, any questions this is a great opportunity to speak, um, well, not speak directly, I guess, but have me read your questions to our panelists and um, take advantage of sort of having them all here um, to learn from them. So our first question from an audience member, I think I'm going to um, give to Perna, um, but uh, panelists, please do let me know if you have something that you'd like to add. Um, and I'll be happy to turn to you as well. And one quick note, just given our, we are, a bit behind schedule, so just please do be conscious of time and maybe we can try to keep responses to just a couple of minutes. Um, so Perna, a question to you. How should peacekeeping training centers address the increased need of training to prevent sexual abuse of peacekeepers? So many courses al already have these types of, uh, so many courses already have the subject matter, um, but it doesn't seem to be enough. So what can training centers do better? Thank you, Gretchen. And if I talk too long, just wave at me or something. I'm not keeping an eye on the chat. Um, so thank you for that. I have just shared in the chat a link to a paper I did around training standards. Now, I mentioned earlier that 30 years of work around training has shown how it hasn't been effective. It hasn't brought change. And I think part of the issue around training has been that it's been about organizational reputational management rather than substantive change with the big structural issues that you identify in your report and that we all know lie at the heart of all forms of sexual abuse. So issues of inequality, power, hierarchy, protection of favored or senior folk, um, and the silencing or the, the, the sh shaping has not been credible, the voices of victims and survivors who dare to speak up. So what we did was we examined why it wasn't working. Uh, and we, you know, I've been to a few events around these things over the last few years, and we, we end up with a little joke, because if the training is a two hour thing you do online, you can tick a few boxes here and there, and still do your ironing or watch a TV program at the same time, why do you think it's going to bring change? What is it other than a tick box exercise for the organization? So here's what we said, training should be linked to the values of an organization. Setting up what the values of an organization uh, should be is should be a collective exercise and we talk, I talked about collective ownership of this project uh, of, of cultural change so what sort of organization do you want to be what sort of principles and values should it have and where are we now that allows sexual abuse to happen or that denies accountability or that minimizes credibility so what are those conditions that facilitate those things and then training should be part of the project of getting from here where you are now to there where you want to be. It has to be done by people who understand the issues of structural inequality. It has to go beyond what I call the three Ps, which are what most organizations tend to do, which is here's our policy, here's our procedures, here's the prohibited behaviors. That's not enough. The fourth P that is missing, if we're serious about elimination ending is prevention. 
and that oh I didn't mean did I just do something there sorry and that that is a bigger project that is harder work you have to understand there is no low-hanging fruit here you have to be in it for the long haul and as Philippa says you have to be prepared to be made uncomfortable the challenge is what you do as a result of that discomfort reflect on it and think about where that takes you I'll stop thanks Gretchen Thank you so much, Perna. Um, do any of our other panelists want to add anything to what Perna said? Just to be, you're welcome to unmute yourself. Okay, great. Um, so that's really I helpful. Don't, uh, sorry, oh. I'm just yes, interrupting please. you. I just, okay. I think what we don't do in our training, um, and I'm not, uh, it's, it's not that effective, I have to say, but people do it and what have you. And, and I've met people who've got the certificate on the wall and then they have, I don't know what they learned, but they have then been um, disciplined for sexual exploitation. Uh, so, but I think what is often missing, um, as Perna said, we talk we talk about um, the conduct that you're supposed to engage, and you know how you're supposed to be, what you're not supposed to do, what will happen to you, but we never talk about much what happens to the people and what happens to the, uh, to the individuals who are affected. So, and that does change people's minds. If you can talk about, I mean, just the fact when I say to people and some of these people are left with a child, that astonished even my UN colleagues. They didn't quite understand that sex might lead to pregnancy. Um, so, and then if you can, have the you know and this is where it becomes very important to have victim survivors willing to to participate or at least um provide their accounts so those accounts can be provided um to a broader uh, a broader scenario so for example most recent and recently in february the secretary general had a town hall meeting and one of my advocates from the field spoke about the situation of two women who've been left with children uh, from the NUSTA personnel. And you could see the, the, the visible change. I mean, people's understanding gets a little better. So I think in terms of our training, whatever you're going to do, make it something uh, which goes well beyond this is what you're not supposed to do. And if you do, if you get caught, highly unlikely, this is what will happen to you. To, but so and, and talk about what will what you have done uh, to the people you've abused. Great, thank you so much, Jane. That's yeah, very um, very helpful. Um, so next, I'd love to turn to Diane um, again, one of the three authors of the report. Um, Diane, I know you and Phoebe together have done similar work on a, a related topic. Um, you know, and I've, I've been really impressed with how you both have both built on other people's work, but also taken the work that you had done previously working on the humanitarian space and transferred a lot of those lessons learned and sort of your um, your methodological approaches um, to this project. So I would love to hear a bit from you, Diane, on what some next steps um, can be with this work. So both from the policy side, but also from the research side. I mean, this is a, a groundbreaking report really, um, you know, and I think there is so much more to be done um, in this area. So yeah, so I'd love if, if you could just tell us a little bit about your, your thoughts on, on what next steps might be. Great, thank you very much, Gretchen. Um, and thanks to all my colleagues and the IPI and the Government of Canada for the important support. Um, so I think a couple of things. Uh, one is that, um, What's really clear is that the kind of policies and attention to sexual abuse of peacekeepers and as we've been saying, um, sexual abuse and exploitation of host communities have been artificially separated as if somehow those things aren't connected. Um, but those, those forms of abuse are absolutely fueled by the same dynamics, which is around this kind of patriarchal militarism and inequality. So the responsibility for addressing that has to be twofold. It's both the troop and police contributing countries and the UN. Right now, the UN has a really hands-off approach. It's a very hands-off approach for um, any kind of disciplinary work with peacekeepers. That's, oh, the, the countries will take care of it. But what we're seeing is that the countries are not taking care of it. Um, it was 
you know, we had a number of, in our study, we had a number of um, peacekeepers who said, I think more than 50% that their, when they made the complaint, that they thought their countries handled it in the worst way possible. I mean, they couldn't give them a lower um, standard for, for how they conducted it. So there has to be that link. Number one, this is about this is about patriarchal militarism. This is about gender inequality. This is about racism, different kinds of inequalities, and that they're linked, and that the abuse of the host communities is also linked with the abuse of the peacekeepers, and the abuse of the peacekeepers is linked with the host countries. So um, I think the the UN has really got to step it up, and its member nations have to step it up to start looking hard at their own police and military uh, cultures, um, what's going on in them, what their reporting mechanisms. The prevailing sentiment from the people we interviewed was that perpetrators are not held accountable. We had our own colleague talk about this, his own experience, um, due to a culture of impunity. And actually what's happening is that the current systems are so insufficient and ineffective that particularly women peacekeepers, our research found, actually are just trying to protect themselves. So, um, and they're trying to protect other women by telling them who the who the serial perpetrators are. So, I think, in terms of the future policy work, if the UN and the troop and police contributing countries don't prevent and respond to sexual abuse, and dismantle and really take on and be uncomfortable. Um, in taking a hard look at some of the toxic things that are going on in these cultures, then the initiatives to increase women's meaningful participation in peacekeeping, it's gonna fail, right? So I think um, that is the goal, but the steps to make that goal happen, the, the, what comes before, it's not there. So I think in terms of the policy work that has really got to be addressed. Number one, they got to take a hard look at themselves. And as um, Perna was saying, they've got to um, think about how are they being informed by their own survivors. Um, and Jane has also said that as well. And in terms of future research, um, I think that there would need to be, I mean, I'd love to see some look at the different um, reporting mechanisms of the different countries and the troop contributing countries and the police contributing countries. You know, what is actually going on there? Um, interestingly, there's, I mean, as we might expect, there's, there's a range. So some people, some people reported that actually they thought their agency did a great job handling their reports. Oh, I'd love to learn from them. People who think they couldn't do a worse job than they did, so important to learn from them. Um, so I'd really like to learn more on that. Uh, I think, you know, another thing is, is that peacekeepers um, from around the world, as you'll see from our report demographics, were really willing to talk about this. Um, so this is an issue that has, in my opinion, probably been silenced, which is about power, which is about silencing it. Because when that report went out, we were amazed within a month how many responses we got from all over the world. Um, so I think these are real issues that peacekeepers are also wanting to engage in. Thank you. Thank you so much, Diane. Do any other panelists have anything that they want to add to Diane's remarks? Um, this is a great group to be guiding future discussions on this topic. So if anyone else has- May I, may I go just funny? Yes, just please. quickly, just want to endorse something that Diane just said around, you know, the question of, uh, of trust and listening to people. I think, um, you know, there's, there's, there's so much about why people don't report uh, that is about the systems and the procedures that it's not that people don't want to speak. You know, I've been, I, I remember when I was first doing my PhD, so we're talking 30 years ago, people, and I was is in domestic violence in India, and people say, well, no one's going to tell you. This is not what people talk about. You hear the same sorts of objections now, but actually, victim survivors want to speak. They want to tell their stories. They want to unburden themselves. The question is, you have to create the right conditions for them to do that. And that has mostly not been enabled around this area of work that the work addresses, um, but also in certain big complex bureaucracies like the UN and in very hierarchical rigid ones like militaries and police, it's extremely challenging to create those conditions. Um, and I think part of that, those changes are about understanding why that is, 
and working to create those conditions and win trust rather than using the right word and then expecting trust to be automatically given. It doesn't work that way, but it doesn't mean people aren't willing to share what's happened to them or to share their expertise about what would make a difference. Excellent. Thanks so much, Perna. Um, yeah, that creating the right conditions, I do just want to quickly flag. It's, it's so interesting how much, um, I would love to see how institutions can better you know, sort of create those conditions where a lot of people are doing that on an informal level. So one thing, I know we've mentioned lots of Vermeer's taboos and stigmas report, um, but a lot of what comes out in, in that report and in a lot of Phoebe's and my continued work on gender and peace operations is that women are talking to each other, victims are talking to each other and they are giving each other warnings. They are creating conditions informally that are not being provided to them by institutions. And I actually, I mean, this is a personal opinion, but I do think there's that can often be very positive, right? Um, but at a certain point, the institution also has to step up. So yeah, great, great flag, Perna. Um, I think Phoebe also um, needs to add to this discussion. I wanted to expand a little bit around the linking SEA and sexual abuse of peacekeepers. I think there's a lot to be done in that space in terms of understanding it. There's been a lot of really great work on SEA, but we, you know, we still hear within the UN and Gretchen and my work has been touching on this a lot, add more women to peacekeeping and that will reduce SEA. And I think that those types of arguments need to really be broken down and looked at. What happens when these women get added to these missions? I mean, the, I would think it's the same group of perpetrators that will perpetrate SEA and sexual abuse of their colleagues. Those types of things need to be unpacked. Also, we could do further research on, are there certain missions with high levels of SEA? And Diane and I were trying to get at it, but couldn't quite get at it in the data. Diane, Evan, and I, are these the same missions where we're seeing high levels of sexual abuse of peacekeepers? So I think by teasing apart those patterns, hopefully that will also make the connection and this internal external false divide will start to kind of fade away. Oh, and I just wanna follow up on what Phoebe said because actually what we do see in the data is that countries that have had a lot of reports of sexual exploitation and abuse are also was were also within our study the ones that had the most reports of abuse against peacekeepers. So that is something we're really um, I think is important to look at. And for the countries that the the area the missions that don't have it, um, what are they doing right or what is going on that those that's not happening there? Great, thanks so much, everyone. Anyone else, Jane? Did you have anything? No, I was just going back to the trust. I mean, I, I was talking about those victims' rights advocates on the ground. And um, you'll be amazed at, I mean, trust is hard to build and easy to lose, of course. Um, but what they've managed to do in terms of um, um, hearing from people, encouraging reports to come forward much later on, um, and so on. So that's something to think about. People do like talking to people. Uh, so that's and, and you do there is a recommendation of that in that nature in the report and I think it's worthwhile holding on to um, and um, and uh, just keeping in mind and just on a question that um, was posed by Perna earlier with regard to um, the victim centered I don't like victim centered I like victims rights um, uh, uh, the victims rights approach to investigations being um, uh, initiated or you know taken up by OIOS. It is interesting that they have, um, they ha they've been um, happy since um, at the beginning of uh, 2021 to um, have the field victims rights advocate accompany, not accompany the investigations, but be around at the time of, the investig of their investigations into sexual exploitation, sexual abuse, not as part, not to investigate, but to be there to support um, the victim, provide emotional support, um, assistance and so on, and keep them uh, up to date with their cases. So I think that's a pretty good practice. It, uh, it was, I think it, it's quite interesting really that uh, a, an entity which isn't, I suppose, known, well, it's, it's uh, the, you know, there are always these anxieties about whether you're going to affect the, um, 
affect the investigation in a bad way, but this has, they have seen that the investigations go better if you do in fact um, protect and promote uh, the rights of uh, the star witness, who is of course the victim. Thank you so much, Jane. And I, uh, I'm actually going to turn right back to you if I, if I may, I did, um, you just got into a bit of it, but I, I did want to hear a bit more. I know you had, um, you know, mentioned in your opening remarks that there, there was a bit more to get into about the, the activities of the field victims rights advocates. And I, I mean, I would love to hear a bit more about that. And I also am wondering if you are able to tell us, I know I, if I wrote this down correctly, I think you said there are currently four. Mm -hmm. um, and I would love to hear if there is a plan to expand that, like what, what next steps will be for that program, yes. especially since it sounds like it's going so well. I always have a plan. Um, the four are on the mission budgets and, and that is how the Secretary General was able to have them funded. So, um, but they are not for the mission, um, not for, uh, they relate to the victims of all our personnel, not just mission personnel. Um, but sometimes that can be a bit of a challenge to get across to some of our entities, which is, is one of those issues with our huge and complicated um, system. But in fact, they, um, they are there to listen to be actual advocates for the victims, and they have developed their own, um, their own ways forward. Um, this um, being part of being uh, accompanying the investigations. Uh, and they've accompanied also investigations by member states uh, into their personnel. Um, and, um, and, and all and accompanied uh, investigations by host states into personnel. So that, that is really a big deal. And I want to really push further for that. Um, the one in Haiti, and this is probably not relevant for the, the topic we're talking, well, it could be, um, she has been um, pursuing um, outstanding paternity claims. We've got 36 there, outstanding paternity claims. These are very, very difficult. And just as uh, any accountability, if you're looking at legal accountability uh, in the context of peacekeepers who are abused, that will be very complicated also um, because there will be transnational cases. Um, and in general terms, there isn't um, legal support and assistance available, but we're trying to mobilize. They're trying to mobilize um, uh, pro bono legal support for this sort of thing. In terms of plans, whether we could have any more, it's very much, you know, this is a very important issue. So there, uh, so this is, but we don't have the resources reflecting its important and the, the importance. And similarly, you don't have the resources reflecting the importance um, with regard to the topic we're discussing today. Um, so I proposed a middle line, and some people have, uh, some uh, some UN entities have taken this up, and that is the, the appointment of a focus point for victims and UN Guatemala, UN Nepal have appointed those focal points. But I'm doing my best to raise money uh, and see whether we can have more, um, uh, more senior victims rights officers as they are called in places where they're needed. Um, where they are now um, in Central African Republic, Democratic Republic of the Congo and South Sudan, although we don't have many reports from South Sudan, but these are the countries from which we have the highest number of reports. And when we're talking of Haiti, they're the cases from the past, which, um, and they're, they're extremely difficult to resolve. Um, so we are doing what we can. But uh, no, the, the work is, I, I, I was trying to work out how to put my annual report, but I think I sent it to uh, Phoebe and so on um, but and um, and it's growing all the time as people become more comfortable with coming forward and of course they're able by speaking and being in touch with the uh, with the victim survivors more or less on a daily basis um, they are able to inform our work better um, and ha have the perspectives of victim survivors incorporated in it okay you're doing your best and you're truly doing so much. I'm really, I mean, I'm so, again, I mean, it's not an encouraging topic. Um, and I no, really no, 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 you're very unpopular you because you're the physical manifestation of the fact that bad things happen in your organization. So as you could imagine, you, you really do not uh, engender enthusiasm when you walk into a room. I would imagine not, yeah, <laughs> but you are engendering enthusiasm here. <laughs> um, I do. I mean, we, Oh, sorry, partner. Yes. 
sorry, may I just quickly, just to, to add to what Jane was talking about, I do think there is a really important need for multiple routes of raising cases. Um, you've talked about OIOS and state uh, procedures around their own troops and police structures. Um, those are both important, but I think independent routes are also crucial. Um, and I have to say, I just want to underline what Jane has said about being unpopular. I know that uh, I was told that a complaint was made to the Secretary General about me advocating for independent investigation procedures. Um, and I think it's really important both that they exist, but also that we know the cost of criticizing or saying there are any shortcomings in existing procedures in powerful organizations. Um, and that if you speak up, you are made to pay. Um, uh, but I also think one point we haven't made enough about is the importance of uh, autonomous women's sectors and the organizations that are community based, whether it's in countries where the abuse happens, whether it's in countries which are provided the troops or the police, um, that we know that those organizations are often the first point of uh, call, port of call for those who've been abused, apart from those around them, that quiet talk that goes on amongst women. Um, so I think I'd really like to stress the importance of resourcing and making sure that those activists are safe to do their work. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Prana. And John, I see you have your hand up. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, time is running, so uh, I'll be very short. Uh, I mean, we have discussed a lot, you know, on the policy side here today. And, and in that regard, I I'd also want to emphasize how important this report is, because we really need studies and uh, the empirical references to add to discussions in the peacekeeping context, because I want to give you one example. Uh, I mentioned this year's special committee in my statement. Uh, we had a lot of member states that didn't really see the need for any independent uh, reporting mechanisms. Uh, we received a lot of hesitance. Uh, the typical question was like, why can't we use the existing reporting lines? And I really think with this report, I mean, we have something more on, on the table. So just my few cents. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. Um, and I know we are just coming to the end of our time, but I do want to, Philippa, I'm, I'm wondering if you have any sort of final thoughts. I know everyone sort of jumped in on this question or, or any, if you would like to take a Look, I think it ties into a couple. I mean, certainly to John's point, um, what can best be done for us as member states to hopefully um, you know, push this within our uh, negotiating opportunities to reform these activities, to create these bodies, to create these mechanisms, is to have data sources like this too, so we can fight against this uh, impression that anecdotes, uh, even though that is data, um, aren't enough to convince them that this is an issue. So certainly anything that could be done to kind of produce more uh, to arm us going into negotiations is, is greatly appreciated. But just to pick on some of the points um, that other, others made, and it ties back to my statement about the role we all play, I think particularly uh, as women and men in our policing and military institutions, is how much we have to change the messaging even to our fellow colleagues. You know, when we say about reflecting on the past sins you know I look at my own and the messages I gave to women coming up behind me on you know what I had to withstand in the early days and it's part of the business and you know toughen up um, just how unacceptable that is and how we kind of as these elder stateswomen elder now um, have to actually ensure that the messages we're giving to women and men coming up are not the things that were told to us uh, and that's really being something that you know I promised myself if I got power, I'd, I'd use it in a way that it, it wasn't for me. Um, but we need to be really careful about the messages we give to our younger co colleagues about empowering them to actually utilize the mechanisms, mechanisms in place and not just suck it up. That is a truly perfect note to end on. Um, Philippa, thank you. Perna, John, Jane. Phoebe, Diane, Evan, thank you everybody so, so much. Um, Adam and Ambassador Arbeiter. Um, this is, I've learned so much today. I mean, it's it really is. It's, it's such a distressing topic, but such an important one. And I'm really so pleased to see this report helping to bring it to light. Um, I know a lot of really excellent resources have been shared today for audience members. Um, 
you know, and I, I would really encourage everyone again to just engage with this report um, and, and also not give up on taking the work forward, right? I mean, really, I, I think, um, I mean, what we've shown here today is this is so, so important and still, you know, I mean, we're, we're further along than we might be without the tireless work of, of particularly people like Jane, um, but everyone here on this panel, but there is so much more to do. Um, so with that, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Um, I hope wherever you are in the world, you have a great rest of your day or evening. Um, and thank you for joining us.